All right, it's uh, half past the hour on this Thursday, um, June fourth. Was it June fourteenth, twelfth? Uh, June fourteenth. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. So today's webinar is uh, another Did You Know series from Oasis Sales and TriLogic. Uh, this one is about proper library management. I'm going to go over various topics uh, to help you and assist you in, in creating uh, library content or resources that you can use uh, that is either free out there uh, in the world of engineering or Mentor provides uh, for you. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started here. So just real quick, uh, where is Oasis and TriLogic and who are we? Uh, we are the authorized resellers for Mentor Graphics for all of the Mentor Graphics tools. Uh, you can see our territories here. If you're in the Midwest, Oasis is your reseller. If you're on the East Coast, TriLogic is your reseller. And then EDA Direct is in California, Nevada. So if you have need any help with anything or would like more information about any of the tools for Mentor Graphics, you know, please feel free to contact us. Go to our websites and you'll find contact info there. Uh, past webinars that we've done, uh, are all listed on our website. TriLogic has them on their website. We have them on our list on our website as well. They will, at least for us, it'll take us to your, or if you go to our website, uh, you will see links to all of our webinars that will link to our YouTube channel. Uh, the next webinar that we'll be doing here coming up next month in the Did You Know series will be Pads Flow Therm XT. In other words, how do you go about doing, you know, real thermal analysis on your printed circuit board enclosure? that you would put around your uh, printed circuit board to um, check your designs to make sure they're thermally adequate uh, for heat sinking fans, airflow, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, there's no more guessing. You should be simulating uh, to, to figure these problems or to figure out these design issues that you're working with. Uh, and this goes for basically any CAD tool out there. This is not just related to Mentor's CAD flow. This product does work with all TMK cadence, any PCB tool, uh, really, because it supports ODB++ input. Uh, again, you can find our uh, recorded webinars out on uh, the Oasis YouTube channel. Anything that we've done in the past uh, on any of our topics, whether it's the Did You Know series, Tech Talk, uh, Advanced Technology, other products that we sell, we have webinars out there for helpful videos uh, as well. Related to you know pads, pads professional expedition. Uh, one of the big one, one of the tools I'm going to talk about today, ParkWest. Uh, we have a video out there and how to help you set it up. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So again, our featured webinar today is: Did you know <clears throat> how to do proper library management? All right. So library management. What is it? And we all know what it is. It's probably the one thing in any CAD tool that we none of us like to do. Uh, in fact, we hear it all the time, you know, I wish I just had libraries for everything I need to do so I don't have to do this. Um, but one of the big ones I hear when visiting customers or talking to customers is how do I centralize my company libraries? Uh, just real quick, that one's super simple. Uh, basically, you just place your libraries on a network. Um, the easy way to control it if you're in a work group of people so that not everyone's making their own parts is you OS write protect the folder that all of your library content is in, and then you give one or two people access to that folder to be able to write to that location. So not every engineer has access to overwriting or modifying uh, symbols out in that library, right? And then you obviously point your tools that you're using that need that library content to those locations. Try not to use local library content. Um, our tools, at least our tools do, I'm not sure about uh, uh, some of the other ones out there, do still allow you to make some local content if needed so that you know, you're know you not stuck waiting for someone to make a library part for you and then you can export that item and give it to them and they can check it in to the library. So there are mechanisms to do that, don't recommend it, especially if you're in a large group of engineers um, where things really need to be controlled. You know, the worst thing you can do, and Again, I hear this from a lot of people uh, that are sitting in old tool flows that 
our big one of our biggest problems is everyone has their own library content everyone's making their own parts no one does it the same way you know i might end up making a part that somebody already has that's because you're not again sharing your libraries on the network okay so keep that in mind next some library management tips uh you know store all again like i just mentioned before stall your libraries out on the network not only is that going to help you from a backup perspective where your company is backing up your data that lives out on the network, uh, but it also gives other engineers within your company um, access to that information. Uh, try to use standards for creating symbols and footprints. There are some standards out there, IEEE, things like that for symbols. Eh, it's not quite as important on that one, but if you're, again, if you're in a large corporation, uh, hopefully you've come up with some standards for you know, how long the pins are, what the size of the pin labels are, what's included as far as properties go on that symbol, what's the rough size, you know, when a part has so many pins, when do we decide to break it up into multiple parts? If it's a multi-gate device, how do I, or when do we decide to break it up into individual pieces, a heterogeneous part we call them, uh, to, you know, scatter them around the schematic, do we break up connectors or not? There needs to be standards for that uh, within your company. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, footprint design, there's already a standard out there. It's IPC 7351 um, specification. Uh, hopefully everyone is using this standard. I know the mentor tools, at least that we provide inside of pads or the land pattern calculator or even ParkQuest, all base their wizards off of IPC standards. Uh, I'm fairly certain um, Altium's footprint creator does that as well, and I believe the Cadence one has some capability there. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to have um, sent out with an email that goes to everyone here after this webinar is a link to this white paper here, the CAD Library of the Future. Yeah, this was written some time ago, but it was really, you know, back in 2011 when it was written. The 7351 spec, I think, had come out shortly before then, and a lot of people were still doing parts made based off whatever method they felt was appropriate for making pad geometries. This document here is actually very close to what information is in the 731 specification. So those that don't have access to IPC documents, uh, this document can really help you understand that. If I scroll down through here real quick, there's an abstract about it. But the bigger thing is it goes into, you know, what is the land pattern naming convention? So when you use like the library wizard inside of Paz layout, um, again, I think even Ultium does it, uh, it will automatically define a part type name for you or a footprint name for you. And this is the standard that it's built off of. There's other information in this document, you know, about pad geometry, uh, how the calculations are made in order to calculate, you know, the pad geometry for a part, things of that nature. So for those of us out there that are CAD librarians or were, you know, worried about this type of stuff, this document will be very useful to you if you if you don't know uh, what this is all about. But again, it's just kind of a reference because there's tools out there really built to help you do this automatically. You shouldn't have to worry about how do I size a pin uh, for my footprint, for my layout to be appropriate for assembly or fabrication. Okay, uh, let's go back to our presentation here. Uh, store your part metadata, the information that makes up what a part is. So how do I know what this thing is? Value, tolerance, manufacturer's part number, you know, is it available or not in the industry? Manufacturer or internal part numbers, uh, items of that nature. Um, that data should really never be placed physically in the library. And the reason why is it becomes very static and outdated. You can't put costing information in uh, your library part because costing is changing all the time. So the best way to do it really is to store it in a database. I'm going to talk about this uh, a little bit more as we go through this uh, presentation here. So. Uh, use automation tools that are available today. I'm going to show you some of those that are available from Mentor. Uh, I'm going to talk about here in a couple slides other free library sources uh, out there that are available. Um, 
so that you're not necessarily using, you know, the stuff provided by vendors because things provided even by Altium, um, I've heard from several contract manufacturers actually that they can tell a design that comes from an Altium because a lot of their footprints are not made correctly for um, assembly because um, a lot of their old library content is just that it wasn't based off IPC standards uh, for building uh, footprints. Uh, where the libraries we provide today, outside of you know some of the old ones that you might have hanging around for pads or expedition, but the newer ones that we provide today were all built you know via the IPC specifications, and a lot of the free library sources out there are also very credible in using IPC standards for their parts. Uh, tools that are available today, at least if you're a mentor customer, um, and even if you're not, uh, there are again, some other items out there. Uh, one is ParkQuest, uh, footprint creation wizard, but it also provides library content from different sources. So I'm gonna go ahead and show this real quick, actually. Uh, I'm actually gonna go to my schematic tool here, <clears throat> Pads Designer. I'm gonna go to the new search tab down here. So I don't even need to remember or bookmark the ParkQuest page if I don't want to, if I just go to the search window in here. I can click on the Park Quest button. This will take me out to this free resource. If you are a mentor customer, uh, this is completely free to you. You do not have to pay for this. You just need a mentor support net account. Uh, so you just need to be, you know, like I said, to have a mentor support net account in order to, to log in and, and create your access to this. And you also have to create a DigiKey account. Currently, we are our only information that you're going to see in this window is related to DigiKey. Mentor is continuing to work with other suppliers to add more sources to this. Um, but let me go ahead and search for a part. So up here at the top, you have a couple check boxes that you can choose. Like I only want to see parts from DigiKey that actually have symbol and footprint content um, tied to them. Uh, I'm going to just type in part of a part number here. It will go out and search basically the entire DigiKey database, so I don't have to go to DigiKey's website to find any of this information. Uh, I can see it right here uh, inside of ParkQuest tool. I'll see all the parts that start with Max 92. These are all maximum parts. Um, I can select one of these by hitting the down arrow for more. I can see attribute information about that part. If I want, I can actually go to the DigiKey page by clicking on the physical part number here. This will actually take me to um, the DigiKey page for this, uh, and I can see more information there if I choose to. Uh, one of the advantages of doing that, actually, you know, this DigiKey is really starting to support uh, more CAD geometry information for you to download directly from their website. Many other uh, suppliers are doing the same thing. But here I can download models, but the big one here is I can download 3D um, content as well uh, from this website, or it'll take me to a site where if the manufacturer supplies it, I might be able to get that content. I'm gonna talk more about 3D uh, stuff here in a little bit, so, all right. So going back to ParkQuest though, what I can do here is you can see the symbol and footprint options or buttons here. They actually have a little icon next to them. If I choose that, you'll see that there's actually a symbol already assigned to this part um, that I can use if I choose to, okay? But I can make my own symbol if I want, um, or I can download the content that is coming from DigiKey and I can modify it in my library. But also if I find a part in DigiKey that does not have a symbol associated to it, I can create my own uh, without even going to my CAD tool. So if I click Create Symbol here, this will open up the symbol editor inside of ParkQuest, okay? If you're a long time existing pads designer um, customer, you'll know there was a symbol wizard inside of the tool, it's still there today. Uh, this is kind of mimicked off of that. I can import a CSV file um, to create this. Uh, so if I went into Excel, like here I have an Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to show this a little bit later. Uh, and using the symbol wizard, 
uh, for making large pin count devices. I think it's much easier to work in Excel uh, than it is to try and enter stuff into a symbol editor. Uh, or I can click on the manual entry of pins uh, here, I'll, I'll down here at the bottom, I can type in um, a pin. So I can type in, uh, we'll just put in pin one. Okay, hit enter. It will add it to the list. Uh, I can put in a pin number. Uh, you'll see that the device, the, the tool already knows based on that part number, how many pins um, are on that device. So it's giving you some assistance there automatically. I can set inverted. I can set direction, input, output. Um, I can set a pin type if I want. And I can continue on making this part. It'll give you the view of the symbol over here. And then I can even move pins around if I want. So I can drag it from one side to another if it doesn't put the pin on the right side. Um, when you hit return, it'll take you back to uh, your DigiKey page. I'm not going into great detail on this because I'm trying to make this just uh, quick and simple. We've got you know, a fair amount of things to talk about here today. So, um, uh, so you'll see there's the symbol that I um, assigned to that part. Now, anytime you're in the wizard, it automatically makes that the symbol. So next time I search for this part or I went over to my parts or anything uh, like that, it, that symbol would already be defined. I really don't want that one in this case. So I'm going to go back to choose symbol and I'm going to put it back to the AD part uh, that I had used previously. And you can do the same thing for the footprint. So in the footprint here, uh, it, it's, giving one, uh, it's giving us one already. Or again, I can go in and create my own um, using the wizard. Now the wizard here again is built off the land pattern calculator technology that uh, Mentor Graphics acquired many years ago when they bought I, um, library, um, PCB libraries. Uh, they're still working on um, in, increasing the capability in here. Right now, you can only create um, small outline parts. Uh, you will get a 3D view of the part over here. I can rotate that around and look at it and see the different dimension types. But if I continue to scroll down here, it takes me through several questions that I will go in um, and I will fill out, okay? And then I can start typing in information here, like what's the minimum uh, dimensions uh, for some of these items. So I can say that's nine. Uh, I can say the maximum is 9.6, the nominal is 9.4. Uh, can continue typing in dimension, let's see dimension two. Uh, you can see that's the width of the part, now I'm enter, or the length of the part, now I'm entering the width. Uh, I'll call this five. Uh, I'm just making this up, by the way. Nothing. I'm not looking at a spec or anything at this point. 5.1, it will auto resize the part there on the fly. Uh, standoff would be, you know, how tall the part or how high the part is so the body is off the ground. So I can say that that is, um, you know, maybe like 0.2 millimeters up to 0.4. I can put in a body height, which would be the, the height of the part. Uh, we'll just call that uh, oh, one millimeter to 1.2. Um, and then I can hit next and we'll start getting into the lead information. What types of leads am I putting on this part? I'm going to do a gull wing. Come on down and choose, you know, what do I want the rotation to be? And then we get to start entering um, our pins. So this is going to be a two row part. And then I can start entering uh, this data here. Again, I'm just kind of making this up. Uh, let's see, let's make that a little bigger. 0.5 uh, to 0.7. Uh, width of the part, what is it, like 0.3? Well, that looks pretty good. Uh, lead span. So again, I can rotate this around. I can see all of the dimensions on there. Um, if I want, I can get direct access, quick access to the data sheet. So I don't necessarily have to just make these numbers up. I can hit the data sheet that will open up uh, the, the document, uh, the data sheet from DigiKey for me. And then I can scroll down, uh, you know, to where that footprint uh, information is. Oh, this data sheet doesn't provide that, unfortunately. That's nice that uh, Maxim did that. 
but um, so I'd have to go actually to their website uh, and get that information. But uh, as again, as you can see, it's entering information uh, about the pins uh, for me to put on this device. Okay. Uh, actually, this was a seven pin device. So there you can see now uh, I have my pins on there. It's automatically building a 3D model for me. Uh, Mentor is looking at adding the capability here in the near future where it will download this as a step model that I can start using um, on my printed circuit board. Okay. So, but for now, uh, it will build the part completely for us. Again, you can go and fill out all this information. Um, uh, the next page will give you the option to choose the nominal lease conditions that are part of IPC specifications. Um, it'll give you a view of the part with the pad geometry, the solder mask openings. Um, you'll be able to choose the outline, um, part outline, silk screen information. Um, but you'll be able to, again, you'll, when, the, when the part is downloaded, you'll be able to access it in your library. So uh, just for the purpose of time, you can come out here and play with this if you want. We have more, I have more detailed information about this on a YouTube video um, that you can watch. All right. Uh, so I'm going to go back. Uh, to part quest, I'm going to switch back over to the actual provided part um, that DigiKey is giving me here, because again, it's going to automatically choose that. So I'm going to set that back up. All right, so uh, I've shown you a quick little um, tidbit of how you can create symbols and you can create footprints using the part quest interface um, if for some reason DigiKey is not providing one. Now, obviously, I chose. Um, all symbols and footprints um, here. So what I do now is I'm going to download this data. So you hit the download button. This will, and through the setup of ParkQuest, uh, again, we have a video that shows you how to go about setting up ParkQuest. So um, the information, you know, where it's going to be downloaded and the integration tool that you need um, to decompress the data. Because all when you download this data, it is in a uh, zip file format that's compressed so it will need to you can't just use it you know on the fly uh, you have to have a tool that decompresses the data and then puts it into your library okay uh, so here's my default location for storing this content I'm gonna go ahead and hit save and then uh, just go ahead and click on the download there that will activate the decompression uh, function that'll unzip it and now I can go into my CAD tool and actually bring that into my library okay so I'm going to open up the library manager tool here for pads designer uh, in the integrated flow so that we can look at you know the parts that are being imported here uh, when this process gets done so I go to the tools menu import ParkQuest data this is going to now in uh, take that information and push it into my library uh, for me to use on my schematic. What it's also going to do, though, is it's going to download all of the DigiKey metadata that um, DigiKey provides for properties on that part. So when I go into the X data book here, which I'm going to talk about more, this is this is one of those tools I mentioned. You should really store your attribute information on your components in a database instead of putting it on the symbol. Uh, you'll like yourself uh, much more in the future if you do. Uh, so here I have the field here called demo PQ. This is my ParkQuest database. And the information that was just downloaded uh, would be placed into this folder. Okay. So there's the part I downloaded. I believe that was that max 9202 part. Let me just go back to digital key real quick. Uh, look at that. Yep, it was the max 9202 part. Um, now, this over time is going to get rather large. So, what makes Databook uh, beneficial to you is the fact that I can search for stuff in here. So, without even knowing if it was in there or not, I could come into this part number field and 
tell it I want to look for uh, a like item. And I'm going to put in max 92. Oops, I need to put a star after that. Sorry about that. Um, okay, let's get rid of that real quick. Oh, it's got a digikey in front of it, so I got to put a star max ninety two star. Oh, come on. Well, my operator keeps changing. Star max ninety two star. <laughs> okay. Uh, not sure why this is not functioning for me here, but um, I can go ahead and pick that device. Um, yeah, there's other parameters, obviously any one of these parameters um, I can go ahead and search on in the design or in the database. Uh, this is really helpful for like capacitors where you got thousands of parts um, possibly. Uh, so now I can drag that symbol uh, to my schematic. And if I go over to my properties window here, you will see that all that information um, from DigiKey is now placed into my schematic because it came from my database. A couple of cool things that again come from the DigiKey content is links um, to external resources. So my supplier link, I can click on, before I even add the part, I could do data sheet, Click on that, and that will automatically go out to the web and get that data sheet for me. Or within the schematic tool itself, if I'm not in Databook anymore, um, and I and I find this part and I go, you know what, someone else is looking at the design, they need to see, you know, what the specs are on this part. They can actually right click over that um, item and then do open hyperlink and say, I want to see the data sheet. And again, right off the part, that will go out and take me to the data sheet. So these are just some of the powerful things that are available uh, in CAD tools today that some of you may not have known about. Um, to make your life easier as an engineer uh, as time goes on. All right. So let's go back over to our library. Again, we'll see. Uh, just do a refresh on that real quick. I go into demo. Uh, We'll see there's the part that was added, and then I can see the uh, symbol that was created for that and all of the footprints that were um, downloaded from DigiKey and available for me uh, actually in the layout. All right. Uh, does PartQuest, I just got a question here. Does PartQuest work with DX Designer? Uh, Pads Designer and DX Designer are basically the same thing. Mentor decided to change the name. Um, so yes, I'm using it with DX Designer uh, right at the moment. The only thing PartQuest does not function with currently today, as far as symbol content goes, is Pad Logic. You can still download the footprint content um, and you'll have to import it yourself into uh, Pads Layout Library. But currently, Pads Logic is not supported with uh, PartQuest. All right. Uh, going back to the library uh, again, you know, how do I access the information about all that metadata um, that was made available to me, or if I'm even doing my own database, you know, do I have to really know a database tool to to do this? And no, you don't. Uh, if you use Excel or um, Access as your database, if you're a small company and you can't tie yourself into um, a corporate system, inside the library manager tool here that's part of the integrated flow with Standard Plus, I can actually access that parametric database. Uh, whoops, that was the setup for that. I wanted um, parametric data. I can actually access that right here in my library tool and I can make modifications to it right here, okay? Now again, this is an access database. Um, 
if I was tied into, again, a corporate system that's using SQL Server or Oracle or something like that, I would not be able to do this, okay? Um, the database editing functions inside of Library Manager um, are only available when you're using Excel and Microsoft Access, possibly SQLite. Um, I'd have to check on that one. Um, but you, you won't be in jeopardy of modifying data that's in the corporate system by using this uh, method, okay? But for those smaller companies that worry about database management and such, this makes it easy for you to enter your own information into a database. So like my capacitor uh, information here, I can do edit parametric data and I can see all of my capacitor um, data that I would put in my database. I can delete stuff from here and I can add stuff uh, in here as well just by adding a new row. All right, uh, so that's a little bit on some of the parametric data, downloading information uh, from ParkQuest. Uh, again, take advantage of this. This is a free tool to you. Uh, just go out to parkquest.com, uh, go up, create an account, um, or get it set up. You should have a mentor support account if you're uh, on this call and you're using the mentor pads tools. Uh, so that you can get gain access to this information. All right, let's go back to our presentation here. Uh, of course, we still have um, Footprint Wizard and um, DX Designer or Pads Designer Symbol Wizard tools that are available to you um, using the Land Pattern Creator. All right, um, everyone and hopefully has used these uh, tools in the past. Uh, if I come over to uh, pad layout here, uh, actually, to make a new footprint in the integrated flow, uh, I need to go through the central library so I could go into demo here and say I want a new footprint, uh, give it a name. Let's call it library demo. This will launch um, the pads decal editor, and it, which is just basically opening up pads layout in footprint mode uh, for those that have used uh, pads layout in the past. And then from within the editor here, uh, when I click on uh, geometry, we have the wizard button. Uh, this wizard is um, using IPC calculator um, technology. So again, instead of having to worry about defining pitch shapes, I can come down here and type in um, all the same dimensions that I would through the ParkQuest tool that I already mentioned to you. Hit Calculate. It will build the part for you. You click OK. And you'll see I'll have an, I, an IPC 7351 part already built for you. Uh, placement outline information, assembly outline information to create documentation, silk screen information, um, all of that uh, already built for you automatically. Of course, now I can modify this part in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that I choose, okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on you know working with footprints and such. I'm just trying to show you quick methods here uh, for building parts and symbols. Uh, so again, in the symbol editor, I have the same capability. If I right click over demo, I can do new symbol, or I'm actually gonna show you the symbol wizard. Uh, again, I'm gonna call this library demo. Uh, I'm gonna do a fractured part here. So this will take me through a little wizard for quick setup. Uh, there's This is the library it's going into, that's the name. I can specify my pin shape, length, or length, um, and the height or space between pins. Text information, do I want to add my PCB attributes? So I can see those here. I can set the visibility of certain values. Like I want to see these properties when I add that part into the design. Uh, I can add more properties back there as well. And then it takes me to where I'm actually adding pins um, on this device. Okay, I can type these in by hand if I want, but again, I'm gonna use uh, the Excel spreadsheet method that I mentioned before, uh, where it's much easier, especially if you're dealing with large microprocessors, FPGAs, um, networking chips, um, devices of that nature. To put this information into an Excel spreadsheet, you can sometimes get this out of um, data sheets by copying and pasting stuff from PDF document uh, into um, Excel. Uh, you can use this for drag and drop, moving pins around, 
those types of things. So the format is basically the pin name, pin number. Is it bidirectional? You know, the pin type. If we go back to the wizard and click on types, you'll see all the different pin types and then all the different pin sides that you would put into your spreadsheet. Uh, you enter that information, and then I can just simply drag, select those items, copy, come back over the wizard, uh, and paste that in there, and it will automatically build the part for me. This would be like me importing the CSV file into um, PartQuest as well, being able to do this, okay? Gives me a view of the part over here. If for some reason I want, um, you know, to add pin spacing between any of these pins, I can do that uh, in the tool. Uh, so here, if I want spaces between, you know, this set of pins, I can choose the last pin that the spaces need to go underneath, hit add space, and it will start adding spaces between those pins. So I don't have to wait to go into the actual symbol editor um, to do those types of functions. I can do that right here uh, inside the symbol wizard, okay? Uh, and then if I need to, add, I need to add another piece to this symbol because the part's rather big, you just hit the plus button down here. Uh, it'll give you what you want to name the, oops, I didn't spell library, right? Click OK, opens up another spreadsheet tab, and now I'm just basically repeating the process uh, here at this point. So again, I'll scroll down, select a bunch of pins, paste them in, uh, have it build that for me automatically, and then I can go ahead and finish this part, uh, add any extra data I need to add inside the symbol editor, uh, and then put that off. It's already in my library. Uh, if I expand it out, you'll see there's the two symbols uh, right there. I can click on them and see a preview uh, right here. Um, inside the <clears throat> the library manager. And what it's working on doing right now is actually opening up those symbols in the symbol editor for me so that I can edit them uh, if I want to. All right. Uh, land pattern creator, this is another, oh, there we go. There's my uh, symbol so that I can come in here and edit it if I need to, like turn properties on and off that I don't necessarily, uh, you know, want to see. Um, reposition property so that when they come into uh, the design, you know, they're in the proper location. I can resize them uh, if I want. Go ahead and save that. All right. While you're in the editor here, um, you can add graphics in the center of the part if you want. You know, I can make the part smaller, bigger, uh, all of those um, scenarios. So it's super easy to do that. Uh, and DX Designer uh, using its uh, built-in editing uh, mechanisms, all right? So also included, uh, or another method for automating the process of building parts is, is um, the land pattern creator um, that comes with at least all pads tools, uh, again, with you know, other products on the market, you might have to go out and buy library tools from um, a third-party source. Uh, this takes what's on the current website uh, to the next level. In fact, at some point, this is all the technology that's going to be placed into PartQuest. But this lets me do other types of parts, um, <clears throat> footprints that were not available, um, say, on uh, the PartQuest website. So a part like this, I can choose that template, uh, click OK. This will take me into the actual calculator where I can start entering all the information. If I hit demo here, it'll fill it in. But I can fill in all of the parametric information off of the data sheet that allows me to have the calculator create this part for me automatically. You hit OK. And then you can use the wizard function here to push this out into your library uh, to now use in your, in your designs. There's some other benefits to this calculator. Um, I can help uh, build things like connectors um, for templates, headers, things of that nature. Uh, this tool can help you build. Uh, I also have calculators for holes. 
uh, into pad stacks. I'm doing some unique through hole device and I want to be able to have it tell me what the pad stacks need to be for a through hole component. Um, I can enter that information and have it tell me what those pad stacks need to be. Uh, when I make the part by hand, a via calculator. Uh, this can assist with calculating your via geometry to use in your design instead of just taking a guess at what you're doing so that your board can op op be fabricated without issues. Okay. Uh, convert units, uh, hole sizes for through hole parts uh, can automatically be or calculated for you as well. So, again, this calculator does a lot more than just build a footprint. There's other things that we have to put in designs uh, that are necessary. Um, so that tool is available to you, um, you know, at least with your PADS tools, whether it's PADS Standard, Standard Plus, PADS Pro, um, all give you that uh, that tool for free or included. All right. Uh, like I mentioned before, there are other resources, <coughs> uh, vendors, websites that you can go to. Uh, many vendors are now uh, supplying footprint data in various CAD tool formats. Um, if for some reason, you know, your CAD tool format is not available to you, hopefully your vendor, uh, like Mentor Graphics, supplies conversion tools. So if only an ORCAD symbol or footprint was available, you can still download it and use our conversion tools uh, to migrate it into our library format. All right. Uh, Move on to the next slide. I have some links here for other resources uh, that you can go to. Uh, for PADS customers, we do provide a, a pretty nice starter library for you. You can get it from um, PADS.com, download ODA libraries. I go ahead and click on that here. That'll take me to the website uh, where I can download this for PADS Standard, Standard Plus, and Professional. Uh, this is a great starting library. It sets, it gives you symbols, footprints. It actually gives you an access database for you to start with. Uh, you can use that as a template. You can fill in the parametric information. It has all the tables and everything uh, built for you um, already. Other ones, again, I mentioned vendor websites, uh, ParkQuest, library services for your pay. Uh, some of those are here. Here's some library services companies. Um, that are out there that you can use. Optum Design Associates is the one that provides the free li library content for uh, Mentor Graphics. Uh, you can go to Ultra Library and Accelerate Designs. They're the ones that are working with um, DigiKey. Uh, they're one of the vendors. Uh, again, you can also go to uh, actual vendors' websites. If I click on the Maxim one here, this will take me to their website. Uh, well, maybe that link happens to be broke. They must have changed um, their stuff there. So you can see Texas Instruments is is actually partnering with Accelerated Designs uh, for you to download um, part data from their website. So again, a lot of these library companies are getting more and more integrated with component um, suppliers. And these types of components are going to be much more, I would trust these components far more then I would trust the libraries that say that come with Eagle or Altium uh, or even Cadence for that matter, unless this is the source uh, for that content. Like the starter library that you download from us is made by Optum Designs. You know, I know they're using uh, great standards or IPC standards for building their parts. They have QA processes and everything involved uh, when making their symbols and footprints. So. Um, 3D models, that's another part of what we have to think about today when building our libraries. We're no longer just dealing with 2D content. Nowadays, all the most of the PCB tools out there, I should say, support 3D modeling capabilities. So like if I go over to PADS layout here, we'll see here's a design um, that has 3D content in it so that I can, um, you know, in the tool now, you can physically place parts uh, in that design in, the, in a 3D environment. You can add enclosure data so that I can see, like here I can turn on the top of this, I could turn off the bottom. Um, so I could see while I'm placing parts, you know, if I'm gonna have um, DRC issues or collision issues with features that are in that mechanical environment. Uh, you can also do DRC functions uh, within the tool. You can set up, you know, DR, oops, I didn't wanna run that. Uh, I can set up um, DRC rules 
uh, to determine, you know, how close I can be to something uh, in the design. So 3D is becoming a much bigger part of doing mechanical or PCB design these nowadays. It no longer should be uh, a requirement for the mechanical engineer to do this when you have all the content or have access uh, to this information. Okay, and this is how you get access to that information. There are several websites you can go to to download this data. Um, I'll have links for all of these on our YouTube channel that you can click on uh, to get to these uh, websites. In fact, all the links that I have in here I'll have on the actual YouTube uh, channel page when I upload the video here later today. So, uh, and again, Mentor Park West is going to provide, you know, as I showed, the 3D content being built on the fly when we're building a park. Uh, in the near future, you'll see that information uh, being able to be downloaded from ParkQuest. Okay, whoops, didn't want to leave there. Uh, data management. <clears throat> so I talked about this. I showed a couple things earlier. How do I go about managing all this content that you want me to put in a database that I'm telling you about? Well, it's very simple, actually. Um, using Microsoft Access, everyone should have access to this, or you can use a free tool called SQL Lite. Uh, it's a very simple database tool to use. It is free. Um, you can do a search on the internet for it and find it. Uh, doesn't require any expertise in database management. There's a utility you can download that gives you access to all the tables uh, for creating tables and viewing and editing the content uh, in the database. If you don't have Microsoft Access, uh, you can use this. Of course, you can always refer back to Excel. Everybody's got Excel. Uh, again, it's easy to make a database uh, in Excel and use it in, in Databook. Um, the better thing, though, is if you're in a company that's tracking part numbers or component information, is that you really tie the data book tool into your PLM or ERP system. Um, you know, Mentor or Oasis actually sells a couple tools uh, that assist in this area. Uh, Omnify is one of those tools uh, that we have information on that I believe um, Ernie from Trilogic is doing a webinar on, um, you know, tying your PLM system with Omnify into Databook. Uh, so you can see how this is done. It's quite slick in making parts. And that tool gives you a full process flow for adding new part content into a corporate system, tying it into your central library to use with your schematic uh, and PCB environment. So highly recommend that, uh, you know, if you're not using this today, um, you know, if you're using an old version of PADS um, or you didn't realize that your ORCAD or Altium could do this, which they can, uh, well, you have to have CIS for ORCAD, but I believe Altium has it built in. You can tie that tool into your corporate system um, so that you're not um, having to create your own um, content. All right. Things to consider when building library parts, whether it's a symbol or a footprint, is do I place all the pins on a part or do I hide them? Um, I definitely do not recommend hiding pins. Uh, it could just lead to errors. I know it was a big thing in the past where you would hide power and ground pins, but then you'd have to remember to go update the properties on a symbol to make sure those pins were connected appropriately. Uh, it's much better if you just leave the pins on the symbols. You can create separate symbols that are just for power ground pins. Even if there are no connect pins, it's a good idea to have them on there just so that you can see uh, what the no connect pins are. Okay. Um, on that note, not all pins that are physically at a footprint need to be on a symbol. Like you might have some connectors uh, that have guide pin holes or anything like that. You can place the extra pin numbers or pins in the footprint, but you don't have to place those guide pin holes on a symbol. Uh, unless they're tied to ground, if they're going to be electrically connected, then you want to place them, obviously. But if they're not connected to anything, they do not have to be placed in a symbol. Uh, so those are the only types of pins, really, that you can leave off because they're they're not required. Do I break a symbol up into multiple pieces? Uh, of course. You never want to try and create a symbol that has, you know, 500 pins on it. It'll never fit on a schematic page or you have to make the page so, so large. So uh, it's recommended to break the part up into smaller pieces. Um, you know, basically break it up into functionality uh, 
type groups. So if you have a FPGA, you would break your FPGA up into functional blocks that are useful to you to place around your schematic. So any, you know, any part getting larger than, I should have upped this maybe to 100 pins, but if you're dealing, if you like working on A size sheets or B size schematic pages, maybe 50 pins is large enough. Um, but yeah, break up those symbols. It's it's really not any more difficult to deal with those types of parts than it is to deal with one part with everything on it. Uh, and that goes for connectors as well. You can break up connector banks um, into um, different symbols so that you can scatter them around your schematics. Your schematics will just be a lot more readable if the symbols are are smaller. Uh, multi gate devices. It's very popular to break up multi gate parts like op amps, inverters, uh, drivers, things of that nature into individual items. That way they can be placed on the pages uh, that they're for the circuitry that are, they're associated with. And the tools manage, you know, putting all of those parts into one package. Um, with Pad Designer, there's mechanisms you can use to determine, you know, these symbols need to be in this package. These symbols need to be in this package. If you have any questions about that, uh, just let us know. We can we can help assist in, in how you go about doing that. Um, take into account when you're building your library parts for your schematics, oops, for your schematic tools, DRC capabilities. Uh, so like in Pads Designer uh, here, um, oh, that's the library tool. Uh, there are DRC functionalities in the tool. So if I come in here and go to verify, I have all types of um, connectivity um, electrical in, integrity and power and ground DRCs that I can use in my schematic. But in order for these to work, you have to place some information on the symbol, like inputs, output pins, uh, things like that must be set correctly on the symbol to make them work. And I'm sure other CAD tools um, are the same way, All right? Simulation models, um, uh, you know, it's a if you're using like a pad standard plus suite, you you have access to things like thermal simulation, signal integrity, analog simulation. You can tie a lot of that model information right onto the symbol itself. All right. So if I go back to my schematic here, uh, let's see if this part has any here. Nope. Um, I think this memory page. Uh, nope. Uh, let me see here. I know I have some analog circuitry here. Open this up, this op map here, go to properties. Uh, you'll see I can have uh, property information, you know, placed um, on my symbols here so that uh, it makes the process of setting up and dealing with analog simulation, signal integrity uh, simulation much easier. So that when you push data into that environment, uh, like if I come up here uh, and select this net, and let's say I wanna simulate this for some reason inside of LineSim, uh, when I import this into hyperlinks, um, Oh, export diaper links. It will automatically have models assigned to it. I have no idea if this symbol uh, has that stuff set up already. It probably doesn't. Oh, yeah, they did. Uh, so now, you know, I'm in hyperlinks here. Um, I could just <clears throat> go off and do my simulation um, on this net real quick to see if I need to adjust my stack up or if I need to add uh, termination uh, or anything for that net. Uh, if this is acceptable, that's great. If not, you know, maybe I need to go back and add some termination into um, on that net, or I need to go into the stack up and I need to adjust the stack up for this design uh, to make the signal propagation uh, work better. So, um, you know, these are tools, take, take them to your advantage and in your library, um, make it easy on yourself, you know, set that stuff up. It's just properties that you put on a part You'd be able to see that here uh, in Databook as well. So again, part of proper library management, adding simulation model capability, okay? And then of course, use data management tools. Uh, don't place attribute information uh, on the physical symbols themselves. 
uh, when you're making your library content, don't throw everything into into one library. You know, break up your library uh, callouts into um, commodity groups of some kind. Your company more than likely does this already anyway uh, with the way they do part numbering schemes, at least hopefully they do. Um, but even my central library here uh, is broke up into commodity type environments. Uh, my data book tool inside of, inside of um, Paths Designer is broke up into commodity type groups, you know, capacitors, resistors, oscillators, things like that. So think ahead a little bit on what those commodity groups are uh, and make sure you use that. Uh, common naming schemes for schematic and layout models. Again, uh, we talked about this earlier. You can, we're going to give you a link to that specifications for 7351 for making footprints if you have to make your own. Um, uh, go out and download 3D models uh, for your library or for the new parts that you're making because you're going to need them at some point in doing your PCB layout or start taking advantage of the 3D part capability uh, in your layout tool. Add data sheet links uh, to your components so that you can gain access to information quickly. So like the, uh, you can download the data sheets, put them on a corporate server, and then put that link um, as a property on the part or use website links. And then do part validation. Uh, if you're working in a large group of engineers, it's definitely a good idea to um, place the part into a schematic, you know, do your DRC checks in the schematic, push it into a layout, do some DRC checking in there. If you have access to Valor, this is a very powerful tool in ensuring that when I send this out for fabrication and assembly, that I'm not gonna have any um, delays in producing my board. So if you have access to Valor NPI, or if you're a large company doing, you know, multiple, you know, more than two designs a month, uh, you may want to look into adding Valor NPI into your process flow. Uh, it's a very powerful tool and can save you a tremendous amount of money um, uh, in your design. So, all right. Uh, so hopefully everyone enjoyed the content. Let's see if we have some questions here, uh, real quick. So. One that came in is, um, are you able to use integrated flow with pad standard? Uh, no, unfortunately, you currently can't. Um, the, only, the integrated flow stuff that I've been showing here with the library manager and such is only included with the standard plus in pads pro um, environments. How do I go about using libraries from my previous tool like Ultium? Um, well, we provide migration tools for you. So from within the schematic um, or the PCB, uh, so if I go to my schematic tool here, I can do import uh, from PCAD, CADSTAR, ORCAD, EAGLE, uh, PADS Logic, um, Ultium. Uh, when you do that, there is a library uh, tab here that allows me to go in and point to all my libraries, or I can do a schematic and have it translate uh, just the content out of that design if I want. Um, so that's your best mechanism uh, for doing that. Another one, do I have to be a current support or on support uh, to use ParkQuest? Uh, no, you don't have to be, you just have to have a support net account. So if you were off support for some reason, you can still go ahead and uh, use that tool, right? Uh, can, I, can I link Databook to my PLM system? Yes, I'm, I mentioned that earlier. So any one of these tables, or I can merge data. So I can actually have, say, an access database with specific information, electrical information about my parts, and then using the configuration utility uh, with the data book here, I can merge data from my PLM system and my access database so that I don't have to maintain my own system or I don't have to put all of my electrical engineering data back into my PLM system if I don't want to, okay? So the data book configuration utility does allow you to merge content from multiple data sources for a particular table. You just need a key field to do that, which would be something like part number uh, more than likely, okay? Uh, let's see what else we have here for questions. Um, 
Is PADS a viable alternate to Expedition? Can PADS schematic PCB and libraries be migrated from Expedition? Uh, really, your best route there, um, if you're working in a small group, there are advantages to Expedition over PADS, and that is being able to do things like um, real-time data um, um, design content, revisioning with Ventures XDM tools, doing system design, uh, being able to tie into you know the cabling products that Mentor has with Capital, um, having access um, to um, on chip on board technology, things of those natures are things that are only available or going to be available in the Expedition um, design flow. But Mentor does have a tool that's in the Pads environment called Pads Pro. Pads Pro is the expedition technology with pads designer built on front of it uh, and yes you can migrate all of your expedition uh, design content libraries schematics and pcbs over to pads professional uh, so feel free to contact us at oasis or trilogic if you're interested in learning more uh, about that tool you can also go out to pads.com um, and there's information on pads.com about uh, pads professional all right, um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, hopefully this was helpful in learning. Um, oh, I just have another question. Uh, how, how Central Library could work in an organization with five sites, West Coast to East Coast? Uh, so again, you'd, you'd really have to have a server area that can be shared so that people on the East Coast and West Coast can, can get to that information. Otherwise, you have to do library mirroring. Um, so you can have a library installed on the East Coast and you'd have to copy that or mirror, mirror it to your West Coast servers. Um, and then only certain people would have to have access to that. But an easy way to do that today would be, you know, have a cloud service or something within the corporation where you can have that library content out on that cloud service or server that everyone from the East Coast to the West Coast has access to. Uh, and then every project that you work on, um, you know, this pointer here would just be to, you know, that network resource uh, for the library content. All right. All right. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope, uh, hope this was helpful to you. Um, if you had colleagues that you wanted to have watch this uh, webinar, it will be available on our YouTube channel later today, and you'll all receive an email from us um, with links uh, to that and follow-up, right? Thank you, everyone, for your time, and uh, see you next time.